Hey, I'm Pastor Phil, and I'm going to be bringing you the, the, the message today. We're in John chapter 11. This is the first Sunday of the month, and on the first Sunday of the month, we ask uh, all the kids to stay in with us. We think it's a good experience for families to worship and hear the word together at least once in a while. So we do that once a month, first Sunday of the month. We have been in the Gospel of John for a little while now talking about the red letters. Um, and if you have a Bible that has red letters in it, um, the red letters indicate times when Jesus is speaking. And God himself says, this is my son, listen to him. And so if Jesus is speaking, we need to pay attention. So we've been working our way through John, uh, seeing what Jesus says in the red letters. Now today we're in John chapter 11. I'm not going to read the whole passage because it's rather lengthy, but um, if you have a Bible that has headings in it, um, mine says the death of Lazarus at, at the top of it. And so this is the story where Jesus' good friend, Lazarus, and he's friends with the, the whole family, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Jesus is good friends with them. He stayed at their house. But in this passage, Lazarus dies. And you all know the story. A little bit later, Jesus calls him out of the grave, and Lazarus is resurrected. Okay? Now, I just want to pick up on a few of the verses in here and then make some application for us. And the first verse I want to point out is verse 4, the first part. Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. Now, this is an important point because Jesus is out of town. And the family sends friends or sends a, a servant to get this message to Jesus that Lazarus is sick. Now, if they send a servant all this distance to tell Jesus he's sick, you can get the idea that it must be pretty serious. They're really asking Jesus to come home and heal him because they know he can heal. And Jesus says to the servant, this sickness will not end in death. Here's an important point for all of us. Jesus always knows the beginning from the end. He sees the big picture. He knows what's going to happen. Now, if you understand the sequence of events, by the time the servant, this messenger, got back home with the word from Jesus, Lazarus had already died. Okay? And then he comes saying, Jesus said it's not going to end in death. And now you can only imagine that that's going to put some mixed emotions in the family's heart. Jesus said it's not going to end in death, but he's already dead. But Jesus said it will not end in death. And here we need to understand, even death is not the final thing if Jesus says otherwise. If Jesus says it won't end in death, it's not going to end in death. Okay? Here's an important point. His promises never fail. Even death is not going to trump what Jesus has to say. In Joshua 24, or 21, verses 45, it says, Not one of the Lord's good promises failed to the house of Israel. Every one was fulfilled. And in 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. God keeps His promises. We need to get that in our heads. Because sometimes I think uh, we question whether... He really keeps His promises or not. But the Bible says He keeps His promises. It reminds me of one of my favorite movies. I think it's the most quotable movie of all time. The Princess Bride. Probably seen that movie a dozen times or more. And I'm not going to get into the most quotable parts, but there's a part in there where it's Wesley and Buttercup. They're this romantic interest together. And Wesley is going to go off and make his fortune, and then he plans to come back and marry Buttercup. And he tells Buttercup, I will always come for you. He says, hear this now. I will always come for you. And she says, but how can you be sure? And he says, this is true love. You think this happens every day? And then a while later, the story, uh, several years have passed, I think, or at least a, a time has passed. And Buttercup has now engaged to somebody else. And Wesley shows up on the scene. And he says, I told you I would always come for you. Why didn't you wait for me? 
And she says, well, you were dead. Or so she thought he was, at least. And he says, death cannot stop true love. It can only delay it for a little while. She says, I will never doubt again. And then even later in the movie, it appears that he is dead again. Actually, I think he does die. He's mostly dead. <laughs> if, you know the, if you know the movie, it's really funny. But Buttercup doesn't doubt. My Wesley will come for me. My Wesley will come for me. God's promises are always true. If he says this sickness will not end in death, it will not end in death. So consider God's promises to you. Perhaps God has spoken into your life, either just in your own prayer time or perhaps through a prophetic word or something like that. Has God spoken to you? And maybe you're sitting there thinking, I wonder if God lied or if maybe God forgot. I want to say to you, His promises never fail. His promises never fail. And then, if you drop down to verses 21 and 22, you will see that Martha had faith. You know, she kind of starts off not sounding so full of faith because she says, Lord, if you had been here, <laughs> he wouldn't have died. But then she shows her faith by saying, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She had faith that Jesus could fulfill his promise. Now back in verse 4, after Jesus says, uh, this sickness will not end in death, he says, it is for God's glory. Okay, there's a higher purpose, God's glory here. And now, no doubt the disciples were perplexed over a few matters. And maybe some of these will ring true for you. First of all, if Jesus loved Lazarus so much, why did he let him get sick in the first place? Doesn't that sound like a common complaint? If God really loves me, why am I going through all this trouble? Okay? How about this? Why did he delay going to the sisters and heal Lazarus right away? And for that matter, couldn't he have healed Lazarus from a distance? He did that once before. Jesus could have prevented Lazarus' sickness, and he could have healed Lazarus from a distance, but he chose not to. That's an interesting concept. He could have done those things, but he chose not to. He saw an opportunity to bring glory to God the Father. Here's an important point. It's not important that we Christians are comfortable, but it is important that we glorify God in all that we do. I also want to say this to you. Sometimes God allows trouble in order to point people to Jesus. And if you've been a Christian very long, you can probably recognize that or have seen that, that somebody just doesn't give a rip about faith at all until some crisis comes into their life. Then all of a sudden, God really matters. And sometimes God is doing that on purpose because He wants to point people to Jesus. Think of Job. Job did nothing wrong. He was a righteous man. And yet trouble came anyway, and the real test was whether he would continue to glorify God even though trouble was there. Now I also want to say this to you. Not all trouble comes as a direct result of sin. Okay? Sometimes you're experiencing trouble because you have been a bonehead. Okay, sometimes, let's just be honest, sometimes you brought it on yourself. True. Some of the trouble I've experienced is because I was an idiot. Okay, you're not supposed to call other people idiots, but I can call myself one. Sometimes the trouble I've had has come from that. Okay? But sometimes trouble is just an effect of living in a sinful fallen world. Okay? This world is not perfect. And so we're going to experience trouble. 
And sometimes God allows those things to happen, but all the while He's working behind the things to, to bring glory to Jesus. You understand? 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So when you're sick, be sick for the glory of God. When you're in trouble, go through trouble for the glory of God. You understand the point I'm making? Make sure God gets the glory. If, if you're going through trouble, don't behave in such a way that disgraces God. Handle it in such a way that gives God glory and honor. Now, a lot of times when we are in trouble, we ask the question, why? Guilty as charged. I do. When trouble comes my way, Lord, why is this going on? Help me understand. And sometimes I say it just like that with that tone and everything. You understand? But we need to remember Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. God himself says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God sees and understands things that we don't see and don't understand. Now, back to our story, imagine Mary and Martha and their brother dies. And this is Jesus' good friends. This isn't just a stranger, not just somebody off the street whom Jesus healed people like that too, but these are his good buddies. And Lazarus dies. God's ways are higher than our ways. You have to understand that and trust Him. Now I want to drop down to verse 25. We see this interesting conversation between Martha and Lazarus. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Okay, there's been some doubting going on, wondering what's going on. My brother died. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And let me just pause right here and say this is the hope of all true believers. Resurrection and eternal life. Can I just encourage you with that today? Resurrection and eternal life. And let's talk about the resurrection. This life will not end in death for true believers. To sort of paraphrase Jesus. One day we will rise again and live again. And we get resurrected bodies. Hallelujah. <laughs> Think about that. Our bodies are going to be something like Jesus when He uh, appeared to the disciples after His resurrection. We will be imperishable. That is free from decay and death. We will be powerful, not subject to disease or weakness any longer. And we will be supernatural, not bound by the laws of nature, and able to stand fully in God's presence. You see, in the Bible it says that no one can stand in the presence of God. Nobody can be in God's presence and live. And yet, one day... In the glorious kingdom of God, once we are in our resurrected supernatural bodies, we will be able to stand in the presence of God and see Him fully. Wow. Can you imagine that? I mean, we just get little glimpses of God, or sometimes we just get that, for lack of a better description, that kind of tingly feeling when you just know God is in the house, and it's like, wow, that's really awesome. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when you get to see God in all of His glory? Whoa! But Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and so that is a promise for us. This world and the life as we know it currently is not the way God intended things to be. But one day, He is going to restore and renew things 
and we will have those resurrected supernatural bodies. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Then I want to point out verse 35. I know it's not in red letters, but it's an important verse. It says, Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. I think there's another verse that only has uh, two words in it, but this has the fewest number of letters, so it makes it officially the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. This shows us the heart of God. You can also see in verse 33 and in verse 38, that Jesus was deeply moved. Okay? Now understand, Jesus has already said this sickness will not end in death. So he knows that Lazarus is going to be raised up momentarily. And yet Jesus is moved because he identifies with people. He sees his good friends who are feeling the sorrow of losing their loved one. And Jesus wept. God's love for His own is not a pampering love. It is a perfecting love. The fact that He loves us and we love Him is no guarantee that we will be sheltered from the problems and pains of life. After all, the Father loves His Son. And yet, He allowed His Son to experience the shame and pain of the cross. So we must never think that love and suffering are incompatible. Jesus loved Lazarus, and he died. Jesus loved Mary and Martha, and they experienced the loss of their loved one. In fact, Jesus was frequently moved by compassion. Here he wept as he saw what was going on, but he's frequently moved by compassion. You can see in Matthew 9, 36, he saw the crowds that they were helpless and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says that God is the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. And in James 5.11, it says the Lord is full of compassion. Let me say this to you. God cares about you and God cares about your situation. I know when you are in the heat of trouble, it seems like God's a million miles away and could care less what's going on in my life. Right? Let's be totally honest. A lot of times when we're in the thick of it, that's how it feels. Like, God, where are you? But I want you to know, He is the Lord of compassion. And He cares about what you are going through. He really does. Now let's back to our story and drop down to verse 43. And Jesus calls to the grave, Lazarus, come out! And verse 44 says, the dead man came out. Isn't that awesome? The dead man came out. Jesus calls the dead to life. Now here it's in the natural, but ultimately he calls the dead to life in the spiritual. C.S. Lewis says this, I think it's a really good point. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. Good point. He, just, he doesn't want you to just be a better person. He wants you to be spiritually alive because you have been spiritually dead. That's what it says in Ephesians 2.1. You were dead in your sins and in your transgressions. And in Colossians 2.13 it says, You were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, but now God has made you alive in Christ. Jesus wants to make dead things alive. And there's a whole bunch of, if you will, dead people in the world today. Spiritually, they are dead. Jesus wants to give them life. And notice, 
that Lazarus had been in the grave for four days, but when Jesus calls, he comes alive and he comes out of that grave. And it's at the word of Jesus that he gets that life. And that same thing is true for us today. We receive life from his word. When we find ourselves confronted by disease, disappointment, delay, and even death, sometimes our only encouragement is the word of God. And we need to learn to live by faith and not by sight. You can find that in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. To trust what God says. Remember my opening point, His promises never fail. Matthew 4, 4 says, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. His word gives us life. And then finally, in verse 44, Jesus says, take off his grave clothes. And they said, ew, he's been dead a while, Lord. (laughs) Take off his grave clothes. Let me just get right to the point. Now that he has brought us spiritually, he has brought us from death to life, we are called to no longer live in grave clothes. It's time for a change. How many enjoy upgrading their wardrobe from time to time? Yeah. You're like, whoa, some of them. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, we kind of like to get a new outfit from time to time. Well, God calls us to put on a new outfit. You've been dead and you've been stinky. Time for something new. He brought you to life. You're not dead anymore, so put on some new clothes. Now let me tell you what the new clothes are. Colossians 3.12 As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. There's our new clothes. Since you are no longer dead anymore, don't wear grave clothes. Instead, put on God clothes. Compassion. Literally, that is bowels of mercy. I like the sound of compassion better. It's just kind of weird sounding. But it means heartfelt compassion, sympathy. Who I sort of identify with what other people are going through and, and, and have a heart of compassion for them. That's the idea. Kindness is goodness in action. It's to show benevolence to others. So you see somebody in need, you're there helping them out. That's kindness. Humility is a deep sense of your own moral littleness. I'm a long ways away from being perfect. That's humility. It also contains the idea of modesty, selflessness, and it is the opposite of arrogance. And then there's gentleness. That's meekness. It's the idea of not being harsh. And in a very practical sense, it means to not raise your voice. That's gentle. Patience. Ah, Patience is a toughie. Because a very literal translation of this word is long-suffering. To suffer a long time. Patience. It's the idea of constancy. You know, just kind of steady on. It's the idea of perseverance. Continuing on and pressing forward. It's also forbearance. Which means to put up with other people that rub you the wrong way. That's all contained in this thought of patience. But then, listen to this definition I found that really elaborates on patience. It's emotional calm in the face of provocation or misfortune and without complaint or irritation. So I only get a C on that one. Okay? 
Because I've actually got to a point in my life where I do pretty good with the first half of this. Emotional calm in the face of provocation or misfortune. Most of the time, I'm probably 90% somewhere in there that I can kind of stay even keeled, don't get too hot, don't sh- demonstrate a lot of, you know, emotion. I'm pretty even keeled, okay? So the emotional calm in the face of provocation or misfortune, A. But without complaint or irritation, D minus. <laughs> yeah, I can stay calm in a tough situation, but usually I complain about it and I get irritated over it. The Bible says, people say, confession's good for the soul. I'm confessing to you today. That I might look calm on the outside, but sometimes I'm boiling on the inside. But that's patience. Lord, help me to grow in patience. I don't want to be running around naked. These are my spiritual clothes. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Lord, help us. He's called us from death to life. So let's not live like dead people anymore. That's kind of a conundrum, isn't it? To live like a dead person? My brain's going to get caught in a temporal loop there. But live the life He's called us to and be clothed with what He has given us to wear. So here it is. Jesus sees the end from the beginning. The sickness will not end in death, even though it would sure look like it ended in death. Jesus knew the end. and He could say so. And His promises never fail. There are some in the room that that's really the point you need here today. His promises never fail. His promises never fail. If you've received a word from the Lord, it will happen. It might seem like God forgot because time has passed or circumstances have changed, but His promises never fail. And He calls us from death to life. We don't have to be dead anymore. We can be alive. Because of these things, everything we do should be for His glory. Give Him glory. And let's clothe ourselves with Christ-like characteristics. He's the resurrection and the life. He gives life to people. Aren't you thankful for the life you have in Jesus? There's more than just a few years on this earth, as the Scripture says, your life is just a, a vapor. You know, or if you put it up on the screen, and it's a big, long line, you're just a little dot. But with Jesus, you get to go all of eternity. And we talked, I think it was last week, we talked about the abundant life even now. Life to the full as you walk with Jesus. It's all through Jesus. ask Dave and Sue are going to come and uh, close us today and then Naomi and I are want to be at the back so we can kind of mix with you guys a little bit so thank you have a good week and that is something important for us to remember God truly is a good guy. So, if you'll close your eyes, let's let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the day. We thank you for this message. We ask, Lord, that it'll grow deep inside of us, that Jesus never fails, that his promises are true, your promises are true, and that they never fail. We ask, God, that you'll just go before us and guide us each and every day 
this week and the coming weeks. We ask, Lord, that you'll just give us the strength that we need. But, Lord, let us remember that you never fail. And we ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Before you take off, a couple little things. One, hola. Greetings from two of the Mexican churches that we stopped at. We stopped at, for those who have gone to Mexico with us before, Aqua Viva, the purple church. They say hello. They have done a remodel. So if you are interested in the remodel, you're going to have to come down with us to look at it. Because I don't think anybody took a picture. And secondly, if any of you need prayer, Susan and I are here today. If you need us to pray for something, you can come up and we'll pray with you. Otherwise, you're dismissed. Go with God and have a blessed week.